Everybody, well, thank you for being here. Welcome to our professional development webinar series. Welcome back after a long delay. Sorry we haven't been with you for a few months now, but it's great to be back here presenting with you. Um, and our presenter today is Jonathan Montaldo, and he's going to be speaking about learning wisdom in the school of your own life, Thomas Merton's practice for contemplative prayer, uh, especially in celebration of Merton's 100th birthday this coming Saturday. So those of you, for those of you, of you who are with us for the first time, my name is Jared Dees. I'm the Digital Marketing Manager at Ave Maria Press, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. This webinar, once again, is brought to you exclusively in partnership with national, the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the National Federation of Priest Councils. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions, and many of you have been found, found the question section already. But that section can be found in the GoToWebinar panel, which you can see displayed on the slide here. Please take a moment now, if you haven't done so already, to find that box for typing questions, and simply click the Send button at the bottom right-hand corner to send your questions to a presenter during the presentation and at the end. And I'll read as many of those questions as I can before we are finished today. I'd also like to take note that this webinar is being recorded, so a link to the recording will be sent to you tomorrow or later this week via email, so watch for that email from in your inboxes. During the live presentation, you'll be able to see Jonathan and myself, our, our faces, but the recording, if you're watching this as a recording, you'll only be able to see the slides of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Jonathan Montaldo. Jonathan has served as the Associate Director of the Merton Institute for Contemplative Living, the Director of the Thomas Merton Center, and as President of the International Thomas Merton Society. He edited or co-edited many volumes of Merton's writings, including The Intimate Merton, Dialogues with, with Silence, A Year with Thomas Merton, and he presents retreats internationally based on Merton's witness to contemplative living. Matado also created the 10-volume series of, for small group dialogue called The Bridges to Contemplative Living uh, with Thomas Merton, which is published by us, Ave Maria Press. So, Jonathan, thanks again so much for being with us, and uh, looking forward to your presentation today. <clears throat> Thank you, Jared. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, let's get my webinar started. Uh, show my screen. Yep. Go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint. Thank you. I've got it. Good. Slideshow to begin. Yep. <clears throat> well, here we are. That's great. Great. Uh, listen, I want to welcome every one of you. I wish that I could see you. It would be easier for me. Um, but I welcome you, wherever you are, uh, to this webinar sponsored by Ave Maria Press. I'm Jonathan Montalda, and I am talking to you from Louisville, Kentucky, a city that Merton called uh, my city. Uh, Louisville uh, is only an hour away from the Abbey of Gethsemane, where Thomas Merton spent 26 years of his life as a, a monk and a writer. Uh, I am going to be talking to you today principally about uh, a conference that Merton gave to his novices. Virgin was a novice master uh, instructing all of the new monks that were coming into the monastery for 10 years, from 1955 to 1965. And he gave them, of course, weekly conferences. When I was the director of the Thomas Merton Center at Bellman University, I found notes of conferences that had not been published at that time that Merton gave to his novices, and I was especially interested in his notes on prayer. So uh, halfway through this, this my presentation, uh, knowing that I want to have Q&A, which I enjoy doing, and I want you to have a, 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 a chance to ask me questions, uh, but I will be talking about this conference that Merton gave uh, on prayer. Now, Thomas Merton uh, died in 1968, so it's quite possible that those of you who are 44 years or younger may not have even heard of Thomas Merton, uh, much less uh, have read any of his books. So I don't want to take it for granted that all of you who are listening to me uh, know Thomas Merton well and that you are readers of his books. Uh, Thomas Merton was a monk at the Abbey of Gethsemane, for 26 years, 
Uh, he entered on December 10, 1941, and quite, well, not mysteriously, but coincidentally, he dies on December 10th, the same uh, day, uh, 1968, in Bangkok, Thailand. He was attending a conference of Eastern and Western monastics when he was accidentally electrocuted. Now, for those of you who, who would like to know about Thomas Merton but don't know anything, if you Google his name, you will see uh, that you will hit over 10 million results. So Thomas Merton is, uh, I would say, a very important figure in spirituality, certainly a Roman Catholic and Christian spirituality, but really uh, in spirituality in general as it pertains to the contemplative life. He's a most important figure at the last half of the 20th century, but there is every indication that uh, his writings are continuing to influence a whole new audience and even a new generation of readers. Uh, as Jared said, we are going to be celebrating uh, Thomas Merton's centenary on next Saturday, January the 31st. I'm in Louisville because I'm assisting the, an organization called uh, the Center for uh, Interfaith Relations uh, at, in Louisville. And the Center for Interfaith Relations does many things, but annually uh, they mount uh, a five-day celebration called a Festival of Faiths, uh, inviting people of all faiths or none to, to ponder on uh, a certain theme. Last year it was silence. Uh, this year, uh, in honor of Merton's centenary, the title of the Festival of Faiths for 2015 in Louisville will be Sacred Journeys and the Legacy of Thomas Merton. Now, the latest book that I've done uh, is, was, is for the centenary. I edited this book, which is, has just been published, and you can get it at the publisher, Fons Vitae, if you like. Uh, it's called We Are Already One, Thomas Merton's Message of Hope. What I did was is I, I asked uh, uh, people uh, of, of who are well-renowned and those who aren't uh, to, to submit uh, small personal essays on how Thomas Merton uh, has influenced their life and their careers. So this book has, has reflections by 104 contributors, uh, people as famous as Thomas Moore, uh, Matthew Fox, Joan Chittister, Richard Rohr, uh, many other famous people, Cynthia Bougeau, and uh, people not so famous but who have written and studied on Merton, who have published on Merton. It's a beautiful book, and the, its beauty is because people are not speaking academically. They are speaking, even though they are scholars and, and uh, they're in the academy and they're teachers, they are really uh, stating what Thomas Merton has meant for them. And uh, editing this, I was simply struck by how much Thomas Merton has influenced so many people uh, during his lifetime. And since the book has over 25% of people that, who are young, who have just graduated from university, who are doing their PhD, the PhD theses, uh, their essays on Merton are very beautiful and hopeful that Merton will continue to be able to speak to a new generation. Uh, going back to my theme, that you may not know Thomas Burton very well, I want to uh, take the opportunity to introduce you to what I call the classics of Merton's spiritual writing. Uh, these are not uh, his books. There were over 30 books that were in existence uh, when he died, and there are over at least 30 more that have been published uh, for instance, his private journals for 26 years have been published in seven volumes by uh, Harper uh, Collins. So th uh, that uh, seven-volume presentation attests to Merton's importance. So if you, as, uh, the Merton books now are about uh, 80 in number, perhaps a little bit more, and uh, there are over 250 dissertations that have, have been done on him. Uh, so. And most of his books are in print, which is extremely important. So let me give you this, before I get to the meat and the heart of what I want to talk to you about, let me give you a brief, very brief, a run-through on, on some of Merton's books. 
Uh, if you don't know Merton, his most famous and his classic book, which I believe will still be uh, in existence 50 years from now at least, is his autobiography. Uh, the first book you see there, The Seven Story Mountain, which he wrote when he was 30 years old. And this is his, uh, his story uh, from his birth in Prague, France, uh, up until he enters uh, the uh, monastery at Gethsemane. Uh, Merton, this book became extremely famous. In its first year, it, it, there was over 600 hardcover uh, copies of this book, and Merton was uh, immediately an international success. And he then began to realize that part of his monastic vocation was to be a writer and to share uh, uh, his gifts, both as a writer and his uh, monastic life and his thoughts and reflections on the contemplative life, which uh, he thought every one of us uh, should be living, or ought to be living. And uh, the, another book that is extremely famous, and is an, again a classic, and, and many people have read this book, New Seeds of Contemplation, uh, his thoughts on various subjects. The Sign of Jonas uh, followed uh, Merton's autobiography, in some sense, it's a sequel because it begins when Merton, uh, The Seven Story Mountain, has been published. And it's a very personal look at Merton's life uh, in the monastery. And one finds immediately that the fame that Merton has achieved is beginning to be an obstacle to what he feels should be his Cistercian contemplative monastic life. And Merton will continue uh, throughout his whole life until he dies at 53 years old, pondering this paradox of being in an, in an order that is devoted to silence and contemplation uh, behind closed walls in a cloister. Uh, and here he is, a world-famous writer. Uh, it's, it's a very beautiful book, uh, one that I love uh, very much. Another book that Merton wrote that is a classic, and, and many people that I've spoken to say they love uh, this uh, book best. Uh, one of, of the best is uh, No Man is an Island. Again, a, a book of reflections, much in the tradition of New Seas of Contemplation, and much appreciated. Now, a book that I recommend to you wholeheartedly is Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. Merton writes this book in 1962. And uh, I would uh, say to you that if you wanted uh, to read a book uh, that would introduce you to all of Merton's interest, that is, his interest in the contemplative life and practice, his interest in East-West relations, his interest in social justice, in peace, in promoting nonviolence, Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander would be the book. Uh, if you read it, I would uh, think that you would think that it had been written only last year. So contemporary, so cogent with the problems that we're experiencing in 2015 is this book. It's beautifully accomplished, and uh, to me it's one of his best books. Now, the, the next three books, uh, you're going to think I'm plugging myself, but I'm not. I, I mentioned to you, or I suggest to you, that if you haven't read The Seven Story Mountain, you might want to begin, and don't know Merton at all, you might want to begin with The Intimate Merton. The Intimate Merton is an anthology which I edited with Brother Patrick Hart, who was Merton's last secretary. This is a, a one-volume presentation of all seven volumes of his personal journals in seven chapters. It really reads like a novel. It's not the best of Merton's journals. Uh, there had to be some chronology. It really has to be a story. Now, I would say if you read The Intimate Merton and you don't like what you're reading, you don't have to go any further because this is Merton's voice. This is uh, his voice without filtering, if you will. It's his personal journals. You see the man just as he was. Uh, and uh, after reading the, the Intimate Merton, you will not be able to burn incense to him. And that is exactly what he hoped the publication of his personal journals would achieve. Merton said, I am nobody's answer, not even my own. So this, uh, The Intimate Merton is, a, is an exposition of Merton's spiritual journey, very beautiful, 
Uh, and what is most amazing about it is that you're reading uh, passages of beautiful prose, which are first drafts. These are first drafts in a journal. He's not, uh, he's not uh, 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 revising uh, at all. So it's a remarkable work. Another book that I would recommend to you that I edited is called Dialogues with Silence. Merton uh, was, a, was a line drawer. His father was an artist, Owen Merton, and Merton loved to, to draw uh, figures, very simple ones. And at the Thomas Merton Center, which is the major archive of Merton's work at Bellman University right here in Louisville, Kentucky, which I urge you to visit. It's a wonderful place. Uh, it's really an exhibit, uh, a place of, uh, of, 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 exhi of exhibit rather than a, a library archive. And in that archive, there were over a thousand of these drawings that are collected there. There are many, many more. Merton used to love to do these. And I had the idea of taking some of these drawings, I took uh, 99 of them, and matching them with Merton's prayers. Uh, I did a, a research uh, a study and, uh, of Merchant's prayers in all of his published and unpublished work, and I had a manuscript of 400 single-spaced typewritten pages. So I chose what I considered to be the best 99. Some of the prayers were awful. Uh, and I chose the best 99, and this is a gorgeous book in itself. It's a great gift book, but what it also shows on a serious level is not only Merchant's piety, and he was a pious uh, Christian to the end of his days. Uh, but it also uh, shows, it gives you some insight into how he himself prayed. Uh, many of these prayers, some of them were consigned to books. For instance, the most famous prayer of Merton, uh, my Lord God, I don't know where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. Uh, this prayer, uh, many, many people know, even if they don't know Thomas Merton. And he did publish this prayer in Thoughts and Solitude. But many of the prayers here are, were in his personal journal, so they were never published in, uh, by him in books. And it gives you an insight uh, into his uh, very traditional way of praying and understanding his religious imagination was deeply Christian. And particularly, I would say, uh, what's interesting is his devotion uh, to the Mother of God. Uh, some of his prayers uh, to, uh, to the Mother of God uh, to Mary, uh, one can see uh, that she was a real presence in his life. Uh, it's almost as if he's writing uh, to his own mother, uh, whom he lost when he was six years old. Uh, this would be a, a whole study in itself, so I'll move on. Uh, the, the last book I want to share with you is another book that I did uh, for Harper San Francisco called A Year with Thomas Merton. Uh, they wanted uh, excerpts from Merton's journals, which they had published, for 366 days of a year with the leap, leap day. And, and so uh, this is a, a journal, a Daily Meditations with Thomas Merton, that people have found uh, to be very uh, interesting. Now I want to get, uh, begin to get to the root of, of, of this, the root talk of, of, of what I need to say to you in this conference about one of the ways Merton taught his novices to pray. I have two texts that I want to share to you, which are somewhat prelude to three important texts that exemplify for me, and I think they will for you, uh, Merton's own teaching to his novices about uh, if they want to be, uh, to understand the meaning of their life, they should enter the school of their experience. Uh, when Merton was 16 years old, uh, he went to Rome. His father had died uh, uh, during that year, and uh, he was virtually an orphan and left alone. And this was a very precocious kid uh, who, because he did not have a lot of parental guidance, mother being dead at six, uh, pretty much was an independent soul and, and did get himself into trouble. He's not at uh, university yet. And uh, he states in, and this is from his, his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, he states how one night he was in a pension uh, in Rome, and he felt the presence of his father in the room. Uh, he didn't make out like his father was really there and, and appearing to him, but the presence of his father affected him deeply. And he says, follow, follow this text with me, and now I think 
for the first time in my whole life, I really began to pray. Praying not with my lips and with my intellect and my imagination, but praying out of the very roots of my life and of my being, and praying to God whom I had never known, to reach down towards me out of his darkness and to help me to get free of the thousand terrible things that held my will in their slavery. So the important uh, phrase in this for me is that he begins to pray out of the roots of his own life. He's not saying prayers he's learned from other people. Uh, he's not saying formal prayers. This is something that's coming out of his experience of being lost, of being bewildered as an adolescent, and out of his real human need uh, for help uh, wherever he can get it. Uh, the second, pro, uh, second uh, um, text that I want to share with you, prelude to these three important texts, is one again from the Seven Story Mountain. And this is an idea uh, very uh, important and traditional for Christians uh, from an incarnational standpoint. Uh, Merton all of his life would realize that the grace that he would receive throughout his life from God would always be mediated through ordinary things in his experience. Not extraordinary things, everyday things. And he realized that everything that he loved in his life, uh, books, ideas, poems, stories, pictures and music, buildings, cities, places, philosophies, were to be the materials through which God's grace and providence could work. So for Merton, everything in his life mediated um, God's providence, God's love, uh, God's presence, most important to him. Uh, not only things, but the social situation in which he found himself at, at the time of his life uh, that he was writing, uh, the social situation, he realized, was also uh, a, a, a existential, uh, providential means of learning who uh, his identity should be. And by that I mean uh, he knew that he was not of the 12th century, but of the 20th. He was experienced, he, uh, experienced uh, uh, born in World War I. He was experiencing the coming of World War II. And, and this certainly had an effect on him. He said the coming war, all the uncertainties and confusions and fears that followed from that, uh, the violence and injustice in the world were, had a very important to, part to play in my uh, salvation. And then thirdly and most important, and this is what I'm going to be stressing uh, until I begin to ask uh, for your questions, is his friendships. He realized very early uh, he was baptized at 23 uh, at Corpus Christi in New York City. He realized very early that it was his friendships, his intimate friendships with, his, uh, with people that he met who were real mediators to him of, of God's love and God's providence. His best friend, uh, Robert Lacks, uh, he thought was a voice that called him out uh, to be himself and to really enter a monastery. Now, here we are. I'm going to skip this uh, because uh, I, I see that I'm expatiating too much. But, but look at this uh, poster that I've reproduced. Let us come alive to the splendor that is all around us and see the beauty in ordinary things. Okay? This is the concept, the beauty, the grace in ordinary things. Merton taught his novices prayer, and he taught them, of course, in conferences more than once. But uh, the conference that I found when the director, uh, as the director of the Thomas Merton Center, uh, I was very interested, it was three ways of prayer that he was teaching, and I was very interested in the second way uh, that he was teaching them to pray. And these, this is from these notes. Uh, he said, monks should meditate deeply on their own lives and their own experiences, on their own failings, on the providential help of God, and on the many instances of the mercy of God, on the evident signs of the loving protection of God. 
Monks should know the meaning of life, and particularly they should know the meaning of their own lives. Well, I'm struck by that. Um, how would you feel if, if, if Thomas Merton, or even if I, said to you, uh, please tell me, uh, and you have a long time to do it, I'm not going to give you a time limit, what do you think is the meaning of your life? Now that's, that's a question that you can easily take into meditation, and if, if I'm going to describe to you the meaning of my own life, I will begin to speak about basically my experiences, what has happened to me, especially my relationships uh, with other people, uh, beginning with the, the first person uh, who held me uh, in their hands from my mother's womb. And I would have to begin to tell you what all these significant events in my life uh, were all about. And so Merton said to these young monks, you have to know the meaning of your life. You have to begin to think about um, how it is what were the factors? Who were the persons who brought you to this monastery and to be listening to my voice this afternoon? So that was a task that they were to take into their meditation. What is the meaning of my life? He said, these are from the notes, direct quote, meditation enables the monk to enter deeply into the school of life itself. I love this phrase. I've talked about it a lot. I've given retreats on it. Your whole life, he said, should be a meditation. Your whole life is a learning from God, has been a school of wisdom. It's going to show you, if you examine your life from the perspective of what has been done for you by everything you have experienced, you will find the presence of God and of providence in your life. Meditation is not just about, let me pray about uh, what is the concept of salvation? What is the concept of the church? What, it's not about abstractions. Prayer comes out of our, the roots of our own life. And now let me stress, Burton's teaching here presupposes, especially for these monks, that one has a liturgical life, uh, that one is leading an ethical and moral life. Uh, Everything that Merton did as a monk, all the, all the prayer, all the spiritual exercises, are presupposed uh, and backs up this sort of solitary, contemplative meditation about what your personal life means. Uh, now, these are the three texts uh, which I want to present to you. Uh, the, the, uh, the first one is from Merton's journals before uh, he ever entered the monastery. He's teaching at, at St. Bonaventure college uh, in Oleon, New York, and he, uh, he has been baptized uh, at 23. He wanted to be a priest, a Franciscan, but they did not accept him. Um, so he went to, to St. Bonaventure and taught uh, English and began, to, and began to say, well, if I can't be a monk, a friar, maybe I can live like one. And in, in his notes for, for 1939, he has this beautiful meditation, which I want to share with you. And as I share it, I want you to, 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 to imagine that you are writing this yourself. How can anyone tell? How can I tell? How much he owes to the goodness of those who love him. I don't know what I have written that, could, that I could really call mine. Or what I have prayed or done that was good that came from my own will. Whose prayer made me first pray again to God to give me grace to pray? I could have fought for years by myself trying to reduce my life to some order, for that was what I was always trying to do even to ridiculous extremes and the most eccentric disciplines, and all of us can identify with what's coming, keeping records of what I drank, trying to cut out smoking by reducing the number of cigarettes each day, noting down the numbers in a book, weighing myself every few days. And yet I would have slowly eaten myself out, I think. So here he's saying, look, I've tried to make this on my own. You know, I've tried to be a self-made person. I've tried to be good. I've tried to, to be perfect uh, by doing these disciplines that I've adopted. But really, uh, where I am now, the, the vision that I have, the feeling that, yes, I have a, a destiny and a meaning in my life, doesn't come from me, but from uh, others. He says, these things 
are in, inscrutable, and I begin to know them better than I can write them. How many men have become Christians through the prayers of Jews and Hindus who themselves found Christianity terribly hard? So the prayers of others, some child on a subway, um, a prayer, a, the prayer of a best friend of his, uh, uh, Jenny, uh, may have served as a prayer for Merton. So Merton has this idea from the very beginning uh, 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 before he becomes a monk, that he owes, he already has an idea of what the mystical body is really about, personally. Uh, right before he enters Gethsemane, uh, he writes, he enters Gethsemane on December 10th, uh, 1941, and on December 6th, four days before he enters, he writes a letter to his, pardon me, his best friend, Robert Lax, whom we knew at Columbia. Robert Lax, who would become a wonderful poet, uh, uh, he was a Jew uh, who finally converted uh, to Catholicism, uh, but uh, Merton said he was a Jewish king, really, a, a beautiful man. Uh, and in any case, uh, he's writing to, to Bob Lax, and I love this letter. Listen to it. He says, finally, is the time to go to the Trappist and try to get in. I cannot explain this except to say it in a lot of different ways. It's time for me to get out of the subway and go away to the clean woods. It's time to get, for me to get out of the party full of smoke and pray in a clean bedroom. It's time to stop arguing with the seven guys who argue inside my head and be completely quiet in front of the pace of peace. No, honestly, it's time to stop being sick and really get well. It's time to be full of peace and silence. And if you have a free and real choice between a world that belongs in a book by John O'Hara, that's kind of a book about cosmopolitan New York parties, the high life, and a book that belongs uh, to by St. Teresa of Avila, you have to make a choice in order to be happy and quit arguing as if the two books were even comparable. In other words, there's no compromise. If you want to love God, choices have to be made, decisions have to be made, and disciplines have to be followed. Once he says, I can be in a place where I belong entirely to God, and not to anyone less than God, like belonging to some writer, me, having my legal name, then I guess problems about writing and everything else will not be much problems anymore. So he thought that would not be true. But he says, finally, Harlem isn't for me to go to Harlem and work in Friendship House, nor is teaching at any college, nor is living in Manhattan. So maybe St. Lucy's Day, I sought out for Kentucky full of prayer. And there's no, absolutely no language to say the things that are to say about this except the language of love. But there God will teach me to use that language like a child and a saint until which I cannot talk about God who is all I want to talk about. Now this is for me the clue, okay, about entering the school of his own life and his need uh, for salvation through other people. And in God, while I sing in the big church of Gethsemane, will be also lax, give me, see more slate, rice, girdy night, Hutlinger and Van Doren, and the Baroness, and Mary Jurdo, and my brother, and my uncle, and my aunt, and my father and mother who died, and Brahmashari, my Hindu friend, and the whole mystical body of Christ, everybody. Roger, Gill, all people, Ginny, Lily, all people, the living and the dead, all days, all times, all ages, all worlds, all mysteries, all miracles. This is gorgeous to me. Not only is it beautifully written, and again, this is a first draft, but essentially this uh, transmits to me that Merton did not enter a monastery to escape the world or to escape his friends. He entered the monastery paradoxically in order to never lose the world, to never lose his friends. He entered Gethsemane with the world in the pocket of his heart. Now the last text that I want to share with you is to be the piece that is the text for me, the classical text of what, uh, uh, for me, uh, of how Merton uh, entered the school of his own life, uh, not theoretically, but really. Uh, he 
received the seven-story mountain from the hands of his abbot in 1941. And Merchant says in his journals, you know what I loved most about the whole autobiography? Was the index. The best thing of all is that Bob Giroux, my editor, or somebody did an index to the seven-story mountain, the most peculiar collection of names you ever saw. It starts off with Abbott, father, and goes on to Adler, Alfred, Ellington, Duke, and Fields, W.C., Pete, Smith, Smith, Pete is followed by Smith, Robert, Paul, and there's Bob O'Brien, the plumber at the Oleon House, and Pierrot, the teamster at St. Antonin in France, and the Privats at France, Merst, and Brother Fabian, who went to Georgia, and Mary Jurdo, and Helen Friedgood, and Burton Jenny, and Flag Nancy, and Wells Peggy. I was fascinated. The index is beautiful. It's like the gathering of all the people I have known at a banquet to celebrate the publication of my book. It is like a pledge that they will all belong to me somehow as trophies in heaven, or I will belong to some of them as a trophy. Now reflecting on this, I sensed, I said to myself, you know what, the way to enter the school of my life and to know, to try to apprehend what the meaning of my life is, is that I should make an index. Let me get this slide. Hold on. I've lost the slide. Hold on a minute. Oh, yeah. I can make an index of my story. And naming the people year after year, if I can remember them, or at least decade after decade, who have loved me, who have helped me, who have changed my life, who gave me a hand when I most needed it who turned my life around. I want to name those people. I want to remember them. I want to think about the part that they played in my life. So I am recommending to you that you think and you tell the people that you are contacting and you teach and so forth that one way of praying is this idea of praying over your own autobiography, making an index. Uh, you don't have to pray this way every day, but it would be something that you could come back to over and over again. The people who have loved us in spite of ourselves, and more mysteriously in the province of God, the people who have loved us in spite of themselves. What would that, if, uh, if you pray over the index of, of your biography, it seems to me that you will realize, first of all, that you're not a self-made person that, uh, for instance, the voice that you are hearing now is not a monologue. This isn't John, Jonathan Montaldo's voice you're hearing. The voice you're hearing now are the voices of my parents, my brother and my sisters, my intimate friends, my teachers. Uh, all of those people are a chorus in my heart out of which my voice speaks. Uh, another way, a uh, uh, result of this kind of prayer is humility. Uh, of realizing what has been done for you. We tend to forget that. We say, oh, I did that. No, you didn't do it. I um, mean, you know, this is kind of a cliche now, but it does make a village uh, to, to make uh, one of us. And the emphasis here, which I love very much if you're thinking about an index, is that you are concentrating on your relationships. Because your relationships, my relationships, is where God is happening in my life. To me, it's the bottom line. Uh, especially our relationships with other people. I mean, going to the first letter of John, don't tell me you love God and you hate your sister. doesn't compute. So I have got to have this sense that every person who has entered my life has had a message of God for me, a word for me, and I can spend time in gratitude for what they have done. And there's another exercise that you can do which would be much more difficult. You could also try to realize on in whose autobiography, in whose biography would my name appear on their index. We don't realize. We have a great responsibility to one another. And many of you who are in parish work, et cetera, et cetera will never realize the, the lives you have touched. 
and the persons whose lives you have changed and transformed simply by being an act, one act of kindness, much less the people you have consoled and, and helped, and you know that your name would be in their, in, in their biographies. It's a way of connecting to, to the entire, uh, what used to be called uh, the mystical body of Christ, that whole concept. Now, I, it's almost, we almost have 20 minutes, and I really uh, don't want to take all of them up. I want to hear your questions. Uh, the, what I'm trying to talk about and what Merton talked about, I think, was con contemplation is, is, is a thoughtful awareness of all my relations in Christ, that love is our true destiny. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone. We find it with, un with one another. We are the body of Christ. Uh, Christ loves us and espouses us as his own flesh. But we do not really believe it. No, be content, be content. We are all together the body of Christ. We have found Christ. Christ has found us. We are in Christ. He is in us. There's nothing further to look for. Listen to this. There's nothing further for us to look for except for the deepening of our life, our relationships, our vocations that we already possess. We don't have to go to Tibet. We can stay right here in Louisville and find everything we need uh, to be fully uh, understanding that our lives have a destiny and a meaning uh, that have been blessed by a divine providence, no matter how we define it uh, individually for ourselves. So I'm open uh, to any of you contacting me uh, for any questions about uh, Thomas Merton that you weren't able to ask on this webinar. You can also find out more about me uh, at amongstworks.com. So Jared, uh, would you please begin to, to take over and uh, hand me some questions, which I hope I'll be able to answer. Got it. <clears throat> yes, Jonathan, thank you so much. You're Here, welcome. I'm pull the controls yeah. back over to me, and then um, just as a reminder, you can see on your screen the, the section where you can ask questions. And what I'll be doing is I'll be grabbing some of those questions that you're typing in right now to Jonathan and, and handing them over to him to ask or, or to, excuse me, to answer about uh, Thomas Merton and the, the perspective that he's given. And first of all, I just want to offer my own reaction. I, I It's funny, I, I imagine a lot of people who are coming might be surprised by the the perspective on contemplation. I think we we think of contemplation and we think of you know sitting praying in a in a in a monastic cell and, and trying to you know will our way into this, this divine revelation. But I love the the very practical approach that you that you've interpreted here. And it isn't me. This is Thomas yeah. Merton. Sure. Okay. Sure. And and you're right. Thomas Merton thought, and, and he was criticized this by other clerics, etc. That contemplation was for everybody. Yeah. You know, and there's no separation between your ordinary life, you sitting there in that office at Ave Maria, doing your job, and your spiritual life. This is it. And, and uh, you know, occasions like this, where you're giving a webinar and you're hearing people like me do this spiel, this is a word for your salvation. You're going to take something out of it. You may forget it in 15 minutes, but you are being affected. You and I are connected. You know, you're on my index now. Um, and... Uh, you know, even though we may never talk again, this is what it's all about. And that's what you have to be aware of, that this is important. Like, to me, this is just not, oh, this is part of my job. I'm on this Ave Maria thing, and I'm going to do my thing, and it doesn't mean anything. I am being changed by doing this. And you're being changed by listening to me. And Merton would say, it's not about you and me, it's the relationship. He said, the, the God, this is Merton's religious imagination, it is the God who is speaking through us to one another. God is love, God is relationship. Okay. Good. Well, we have Jillian just jumped in and said, and, and you are now on my index, Jonathan. And, there and you go. Burton, so thank you. Um, <laughs> we have lots of questions coming in. These are, these are some great questions. Um, Somebody, Catherine just asked a question that I asked before we started here, Jonathan. She said, Thomas Merton has influenced you. How has he spoken to you personally, Jonathan? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I could go on for another <laughs> webinar. Do we have three hours? But here's the, here's the short story. Uh, I began, I'm 69 years old. I'll be 70 in October. 
Uh, I began reading Merton when I was 13 years old. I caught something in his voice. He was like a window for me into a way of being in the world that I wanted, even that young. And of course, this was developmental. I mean, I don't know what I heard when I read The Seven Story Mountain at 13, but something turned me on. And as I talked about the reflections uh, in this book that I just edited, I'm not alone in encountering Merton's voice as a young person. Uh, I, I kept reading Merton. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I was reading everything that Merton wrote as it came out. I had friends who went to the, to the Abbey of Gethsemane to meet him. I never wanted that. I didn't want to shake his hand. It was Merton's voice. Uh, that interested me. Uh, I did my master's thesis on him after I got out of the Navy. Uh, and then I went to work, kept reading Merton. I had my own business. My employees would call my office the Merchant Reading Room. And I volunteered to, uh, at the Thomas Merton Center at Bellman to do a project. So I spent a year transcribing four of Merton's working notebooks. And at the end of it, uh, Patrick Hart, whom I had known, said, I've just been appointed the general editor of Merton's Journals that we're going to publish in seven volumes. Would you like to edit volume two? Yeah. And so once that started me, so basically I, for 25 years I had formalized my love for Thomas Merton, uh, editing these books, uh, giving retreats, which is a lot of nerve. I'm not, I mean, I'm not a cleric, you know. But the thing, the reason why I, 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 I the way I rationalize myself as a person who gives retreats is I'm not talking about me. If I'm giving a retreat, you're not hearing the Johnny Montaldo story. You are hearing uh, my perceptions as to uh, what Merton means to us, uh, the lessons that we can take from his life and witness. That's the only important thing. I'm not pushing Thomas Merton, only insofar as what can we get out of him? How can we use this for us today uh, in January 2015. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We have some more good questions coming in. Um, one is a, a really practical question, and I had a similar question. Whether or not it, you gave us one a great meditation exercise about making an index of our lives, of the people in our mm -hmm. lives, which I love. I love that. Um, but another person is jumping in with a question about really applying this to our, our daily lives. I, I, uh, I'm thinking of like a Canadian exam, and if there's like a, a, a Merton version of that, or some kind of a daily practice. But here's what what, what um, Malani says. She says, um, "How would an ordinary layperson, a mother, a wife, etc., create the space to contemplate in the in a busy, hectic world? How, how do you even begin?" She says. Here's the thing. It's very easy for a, a geezer like me <laughs> at 69, <laughs> who is not a mother, who is not raising children. Um, and I don't even have a full-time job anymore to talk about contemplation. Merton would say to this mother that your vocation to raise these children is of the highest order. That all you have to do is to do well to love your children, to love your husband if he's still with you raising these children, and to love your friends. And if you can't carve out 15 minutes for yourself, so be it. However, in order to love your children in a way that your children will say, God, did we have a good mother, you, are, you will have to carve out a space for yourself. You can't be someone who, is, uh, who, who carries her vocation so well that she's harried, she's raising her children, she's doing a job, She's working eight to five. There's got to be some moment, even if it's in the car, uh, you know, for the half hour that you get getting back to your house, where you can um, think about the day and say, you know, what, what good has this been to me? Or to think about, I can't wait to get home and to see my child's face. I mean, <laughs> you will, that's the face of God for you. I love that. Thank you so much. That's very. I think imagine that's just so reassuring to hear, uh, for my, for me myself, but also for the people here, uh, present. Um, so some more again, more great questions coming in, um, and, and people are continuing to ask about books. So it's great to hear that people are really interested in in that. The, the types here's of books the, here's that are the out thing. There. Let, me, let, let me give let me give you. If you're interested in Merton, go to the website merton.org. Merton.org. This is the website of the Thomas Merton Center at Bellman University. There's so much that you will learn on that website about Thomas Merton, 
All the books are there. There are two wonderful people that run that. The archivist and director is Paul Pearson, P-E-R-S-O-N, and his assistant uh, librarian is Mark Mead, M-E-A-D-E. These guys are there to answer your questions. If you're doing research to help you, if you come to the to Bellman, they're going to receive you well. So uh, here again, I told you though that if you haven't read a Merton book, read the Intimate Merton. And if you don't like that voice, you say, "I'm moving on." Thank you very much. Can I ask you about that book? We have a question that I, mm -hmm. that I also kind of wanted to raise too from Marcy. Um, you made a comment about the Intimate Mer Merton about yeah. um, if you if you did you may not like Merton after that, which he kind of liked. Well, Marcy asked a question that I'm kind of curious about it. Whether or not she asks, is there a cause for his canonization, or, or maybe why isn't there a cause for his canonization? What would be standing in the way? His journals. Yeah. In other words, you know, uh, someone said that a saint is someone whose biography is insufficiently researched. With Thomas Merton, what his gift to us is, he shows us, I call it his compassionate transparency. When you read Merton's journals, he's talking directly to you, holding up a mirror saying, you know, I'm really not talking about myself, I'm talking about us. And why I say you may not like Merton is, first of all, you know, every one of us has a way of receiving something. And there are just some people we don't like. We can't understand this kind of monk and all that business. But what you will like about Merton is you will see all of his foibles. You know, he was a man who wanted to be heard. He knew he was famous, uh, criticizing his own monks, uh, criticizing other people. What I'm saying is you're not going to be burn, burning incense to some idol, you know, that you don't, that you don't know anything about. You will admire him. Uh, he doesn't have to be a saint uh, for you to admire uh, what he did, how he struggled, because we're all struggling. And Merton says, I'm struggling too. This is, a, this is not a straight road. Uh, the monastery looks great if you're in the choir hearing us sing Gregorian chant, but come down into the dressing room, you know, to the monastery day for day. You're going to see angry people, people who have to go to AA meetings. What? Yeah. That's what it's all about. They're just like us. And Merton is saying, I'm just like you. But I love, I'm, I'm searching with my whole life for God. And this, this is not theoretical for me. This is a life and death thing. And that will be communicated to you. And you'll get in, you will say to yourself, I remember a young kid, uh, who was a philosophy and, and mathematics major, who, who emailed me at Bellman when I was there. He said, I'm reading The Seven Story Mountain and it's now my most favorite book. I said, you come into my office. I want to debrief you because I couldn't figure out how that was possible. I said, what happened? He said, when I was reading this book, I discovered I had a destiny. I, not a vocation to be a priest or a brother or anything like that. I have so, uh, something that I've got to do. And this is what Merton's enthusiasm for God this is a college kid. This is now, okay? I'm not talking about somebody 50 years ago. Merton has the ability to touch um, another person. One guy came in with a baseball cap. I said he couldn't be interested in Thomas Merton. Uh, I showed him around, and he stopped me and he said, you know what? I'm reading this guy, and it sounds like he's talking directly to me. This kid could be my grandchild. And here he is saying that picking up a Merton book without any benefit of teachers, the International Thomas Merton Society, and Merton is talking directly to him. That is a gift, and you, may, you don't find that in every spiritual writer. You know, they're, they're, all their breadcrumbs are nicely swept off the table. You don't see who, who the backstory, who they are. Merton gives you the backstory, and it's quite impressive and beautiful. Another question? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I, I love the transparency of Merton's writings. I, I, I totally agree. Um, we have kind of a technical question, I think, um, from, from Sister Morales. She, she, she asked, is contemplation the same thing as centering prayer? I wonder if you could maybe distinguish between those two things. Well, I'm glad she's asked me that. Merton never taught centering prayer. That has really nothing to do with Thomas Merton. Uh, it certainly, uh, he would have appreciated what uh, Thomas Keating and Basil Pennington and William Menager, who was the real beginning of this idea of centering prayer, which is based on uh, a wonderful book, really, a classic, 
uh, by an English mystic called the cloud of the unknowing. Centering prayer is, is a wonderful way of meditating, and, I, I, and Merton certainly wouldn't have had a problem with that. I mean, the Jesus prayer, if you think about it, the continual uh, resonating and calling on the name of Jesus is a way of centering oneself in Christ. But Merton did not teach that. Uh, Merton was of the school uh, of uh, Dom uh, Chapman, John Chapman, the Benedictine, who said, pray as you can, not as you can't. That mother who's saying, how can I, how can I be a contemplative and be raising my children and work? Pray as you can, not as you can't. There's no formal, the liturgy, of course, stands there. The, the, the gospel is preached uh, every day, especially on the, at the Sunday uh, services, for our salvation. Okay, and we are praying together, which is as we should be praying in in communion uh, with with one another in a faith community. But but the church does not uh, prescribe private prayer, except suggesting that you must do that because you must appropriate for yourself what all this means to you, for your life, and of course, not just you, but for all your intimates, your extended families, you know, your total relations. Yeah, I remember, I remember the frustration of reading his book on contemplative prayer and, and having him say constantly that there are no practices that we can prescribe to you if you know, to do yeah. contemplative prayer. No, I know. And, and but we all, we, listen, we all want to be told what to do and to have a formula that all we have to do it, you know. All I have to do is eat bananas and I'll lose weight. It doesn't, it, that, there is no silver bullet in the spiritual life, I think, uh, but one must search. Um, Trusting that in one's experiences, one will find the deeper meaning of his or her life. We've only got three minutes. Let me uh, repeat to you this prayer uh, that I think uh, if Merton had only written this prayer, uh, which everybody identifies with, uh, he would have been a famous a spiritual writer. Uh, he wrote, My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in everything I am doing. I hope I never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Thank you. I think we'll end with that. Jonathan, th thanks yeah. so much. Uh, can you say one more time, where, where can people find more of your work or more about you and, and connect with you afterwards? Uh, first of all, you can contact me. My email is montaldo at monksworks, M-O-N-K-S-W-O-R-K-S dot com. And my website is monksworks dot com. And so I welcome, I welcome your... Uh, your questions, and if I can do anything for you, uh, you know, that's possible uh, for your faith community, just let me know. Good. So we have a lot more questions here. So anybody who has questions that we didn't get to, yeah, go to monksworks.com, uh, contact Jonathan. Jonathan, I'm guessing your speaking schedule will be there, too. A couple people have asked whether or not you'll be at um, different events, LA Congress, things well, like that. Well, yeah, uh, yes, and uh, I, I normally do post uh, speaking events, but I don't have a calendar. I just, okay. I just... I just put them as they come because if I put a calendar, people would see how much I'm not doing. Yeah, that right. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, before we before we finish up, so again, Jonathan, thanks you so much for for being with us, and uh, I just want to quickly, you, you, we often offer. Uh, make offers on some of our books related to the authors that are, that are presenting these webinars. Well, Jonathan was the editor of a series of small group resources. These are parish resources, but but are also in, that individuals can use in a, in a, in a 
a personal setting. Um, they're called Bridges to Con Contemplative Living, and uh, they're actually on sale this week in, in honor of Merton's birthday. So they're on sale for five dollars, but you can get them for twenty percent off even the sale price of five dollars. Um, so really, you can get it for four four dollars each if you use the webinar. The promo code webinar one two seven. If you do that by next Tuesday, you'll be able to get a discount. And again, check out um, Jonathan's website where he'll have a lot of the other books that he mentioned earlier in the webinar as well, including Intimate Merton, which I'm going to go check out. Don't, yeah, don't forget Merton.org. Merton.org. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, um, Jonathan, and. and, and for, for offering us. I also want to thank real quickly the, the partners of our webinar series, the National Conference for Catechetic Leadership, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the National Federation of Priest Councils once again for their continued partnership this year. Um, you can connect with Ave Maria Press uh, at any of the social networking sites. Of course, we will have the recording of this video on YouTube and Vimeo. Um, you can also access it on the website or web page with AveMariaPress.com slash webinar hyphen videos. Um, one quick note before we and the next webinar that we'll be recording and, and offering to you will be in February. Um, February 24th, Father Louis Camelli will be joining us for a presentation that he's, he's titled, Chasing the Devil Out of Your Parish, Recognizing and Resisting Evil in Everyday Parish Life. And that's based on his book, uh, The Devil You Don't Know. So that'll be the next webinar of the series by, on February 24th. Thanks, everybody, for being here with us today again for another season of the, the webinars. We're looking forward to uh, bringing in the spring. And Jonathan, once again, thanks so much, and, and happy birthday to Thomas Burton, eh? Yes, indeed. <laughs> take care, Jared. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Ciao.